What is going on YouTube? Thank you for attending our live Q&A once again. And just as a recap, what we do on this Q&A is answer as many questions as we possibly can from both Instagram and your guys' live questions and try to provide as much context without the blabbering on as possible. Just a kind of preface before we dig into this thing. Um, a couple links down below. One is a link to book a call with our team, which would just be me. And we would kind of walk you through what we do for our coaching program, explain how me and Adam get clients results extremely fast. If you're interested in working with one of us, please click that link down below and we will get to work ASAP. The other thing is First Attach Nutrition has graciously gave me an 11% discount as opposed to a 10% discount. So I have to plug them. If you want an 11% discount, which is better than 10, use the link down below um, with Colton11 as the discount code. But in other news, let's get cracking. So, Adam, what's uh, what's your week been like? Uh, been a busy week, uh, getting everything sorted. Uh, you know, a couple of new clients, basically sorting out programs. Got a few clients competing as well, so basically balancing things in there. Or I guess on a side note, it always uh, amazes me how I, I work with clients sometimes for the first time we've prepped before. And I asked them, you know, I like to collect as much data as possible. So I asked them how their last trip went. I asked them, you know, methods and tactics that were used. I asked them about their peak week. And it's wild to me how many clients say, yeah, yeah, I saw my prep and I got given my peak week, like first start of prep. And I'm just like, how? Uh, yeah. Because the way I believe it should be done is you sort of assess the client's needs at the time because, you know, how is prep one? Hey, you know, are we, are we behind on fat loss? Are we ahead? Ideally, you're ahead and you you on time, basically. How they're looking on it? Someone who, you know, who, you know, lacks fullness, you need to alter that. You know, how is the refeed process even going? Uh, so it's always wild to me when it that's, get, gets given, like, you know, literal months in advance. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. And it's very interesting because the amount of variability that just happens in the past two weeks is wild. And so to assume you don't, already know what the peaking protocol might be is really like uh, it's quite interesting and it's i personally wouldn't feel comfortable doing that but that's me um yeah yeah it's, it's kind of a wild situation i recently started uh gear again which is fun and i gotta say i'm loving it so it has been a even though which is really interesting and i've never quite had this experience but to be fair i've never came off pretty much everything accidentally for this long of a period before, but even just two injections in of both long esters, like even Hana was looking at me at the gym yesterday, like what the fuck? Like my mm -hmm. shoulders have just like peaked out, capped out, and it, like the hardness of the muscles just there suddenly again, and it's really interesting to see like this transforming happening so fast, but that's been really cool to experience for me, and that's kind of what I've been excited about this week, of course. And then business stuff as well, learning ads, which has been a tumultuous and long, arduous process, but we're getting there. Um, you want to crack right into the questions and see what's going on? Yeah, yeah. Uh, why not? I, have, I actually have one client question. We can hop into yours. Uh, yeah, let's get this thing. Shoot it. Yeah, cool. So one thing that I've been actually funny enough came up a few times this week. What are your what is your experience or thoughts on localized IGF one injections? Are we going to see any local growth? Are they even good in general? Is it feasible? If if you run it, how will you run it? So forth. I'll be getting a few questions on that. Yeah. So I love this question because honestly, for ninety five percent of people, it won't matter. <laughs> it doesn't apply to them. So it's kind of like, okay, cool. We can talk about it. But if you, you intend on using this as like a first method, as long as you're not a female, right? Like females have kind of a clear route here. But for, for males, at least, I think that IGF-1 administration is sort of like when it comes to weak body parts, it's like the last series of things that, that you do. You know, you increase your androgens, you use growth hormone, you use insulin, you you modify your training program speciality, you enhance the function of your diet, all these different things, and then you kind of fall upon IGF-1. Um, but I, the way I prefer to have it used in clients, and this is something that I've done for some time now, is do bilateral injections pre-workout with IGF-1 LR3. 
So what that would look like is say, take 50 micrograms and let's just say an easy one, which is triceps. Triceps are lagging as a body part. You would bilaterally inject 50 micrograms into each tricep and ideally the same head on each tricep as well. And then 15 to 20 minutes later, touch the weights, get going, move the weight. Have a great intro workout shake and then continue on with the rest of your day eating the meals as planned. That's generally how I would do it with the weakest uh, body part in the current physique. With women, it would be very much the same, except most of their localized injections would be to the glutes. So that's how I'd go about it. The only big issue there in the holdup is the fact that IGF-1, rarely are you going to be able to find a reliable source that's consistent and or real. So like Amino Asylum has IGF-1. I think it's it's worked for some of my clients. Others, it's done completely nothing. And you'll be able to know right away because IGF-1 has this really unique effect of causing pumps to go absolutely nutty. So if you're taking real IGF-1, you'll note immediately when you're in the gym, like I hurt because I'm in such a pumped condition. Um, and if you yes. don't get that, then likely you aren't getting real IGF-1. But that's kind of my opinion. Yeah, no, I mean, to us, we're pretty much on the same boat here. Well, you say 50 to 100 micrograms in each mm -hmm. muscle pre-work does typically work as, you know, roughly walk off figure you'd start off at? Yeah, that's 50 to 100 micrograms is about the Goldilocks zone that I've found for people to get substantial results without mm -hmm. honestly like pumps limiting the ability to produce mechanical tension because that's a, a real mm -hmm. thing you have brought into at some point. Yes, I've experienced that with uh, other oral, oral compounds. And then yeah. you typically run it just on the training days or on rest days as well? I just do training days. So for me, historically, I've just done training days pre-workouts. Um, and that seems to get a large enough effect. And then just the normal protocol on rest days, which at that point in the game is usually going to be insulin, growth hormone, androgens. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, it's interesting because, yeah, I had basically a discussion about it because it was potentially looked at like a potential pathway for actually women who don't want mm -hmm. any a compound which causes additional vitalization because similar to what we were discussing last time, you know, it seems that most people just basically go for the anabolic like the first point of call when really you have these other options like inject YGF1, growth hormone insulin, uh, DHA, yeah. pregnant loan, clenbutrol, which can all be leveraged without any viralization. So just something to consider yeah. if you're interested, especially as a female. Yeah, I think so. It's it's a really, I've had, um, it's almost for me, if I had to rank the top five compounds that I use for females, it would be, IGF-1 would be up there. So it'd probably be something like growth hormone, insulin, IGF-1, Anavar, and then Glenbuterol would honestly be the top five for me in most contexts for females. Mm. For sure. Um, okay, so you want to dig into my questions? Yes. It's we can those, the main rip one. it there. All right. So JR Steele, and he usually comes on here live, and he might be on here later, but... Um, he asked, in the simplest terms possible, can you explain what dog crap training is or DC training? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I wish we had Paul on here because uh, he would probably be the best explanation of it. Yeah. My understanding of dog crap, dog crap training or DC training was obviously pioneered by Dante Trudeau. And my idea of dog crap, uh, which not being correct to so take this great assault is similar to hit style training, high intensity training. So not high intensity interval training, high intensity training, similar to Mike Lentz and Dorian Yates, where you are the whole the whole thing you try to prioritize is progressive overload. So it's not necessarily it's heavy load, but heavy being relative, uh, but also trying to elicit super high levels of mechanical tension. So my understanding would be sort of lower rep ranges with super heavy weight, pretty much. Training with not that high frequency, I believe it was like three or four times a week. Actually, it might have been three times a week yeah. even uh, to DC, DC power training with, you know, some intensity modifiers like quote unquote widow maker sets where you do like a AM rep set of squats for like 20 reps with you know, your maximum load that you can handle at that weight. And in, in addition to that, I don't know if this was part of the regime, but you also had the extreme stretching where yep. I think post workout you're basically take a muscle like biceps, whatever you trained and then, uh, you know, stretch it with a weight. So stretching under load for, you know, as long as you go for long periods of time uh, and as you know heavy as you can. Um, and that's basically my understanding of DC training. So that's probably a pretty shit explanation. Paul has some good ones there, but it's basically a combination or taking a lot of the thoughts or rather similar pathways to like 
by Vincent Dorian Yates, where the, the, the tenants base is progressive overload. And it works very well. It works very well. I guess the drawback from users who, you know, it's done DC training, I actually have done it myself for a bit, uh, or at least a modified version, is that, yes, you're definitely going to get bigger. Yes, you're going to get stronger. If you're progressively overloading the muscle, eliciting a lot of mechanical tension, you're going to get surplus, you will grow. Uh, it's probably the systemic and joint fatigue. So I think one of the big reasons Big Paul from anabolic bodybuilding uh, no longer does it was because whilst it did deliver results, I believe it was just you know, beating up his joints, uh, for lack of a better phrase. And that is why where you need to consider, you know, what you enjoy, but also like what works for you. So DC training is great, but you have to sort of consider, can you sort of get away with those heavier loads? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's basically high progressive overload, low volume, low frequency, um, with lots of intensifiers is basically the way I understand it. And it's the, the big focus is getting stronger every single session and yes. pushing, pushing the weight, you know, staying within a legitimately an eight to six rep range at the absolute higher end. And then some of those intensity modifiers going up in the higher rep ranges, but it's very, very much focused on low volume, um, high intensity type style of training. And I think it's effective for a certain type of person, especially if you're young, and you need to learn how to like manage progressive overload. But I think as you develop age, the taxation and, and, and actual friction caused in joints is just not worthy of continuing forward. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna change the camera angle. Maybe chat can tell us if they like this camera angle more. That not actually just one. Uh, okay, so Hannah Mitchell, a current client, would you say clenbuterol is the best in terms of fat burning, or is it just the most common? I think this is an excellent question. Um, I had a friend ask me about Yohimbine, and I was unfamiliar. I'll let you go first. Yeah. <clears throat> well, when you say the best in terms of fat burning, I'm sort of saying the best compound. And I would say in terms of like barrier to entry and ease of use, probably, probably. But the way I see it is, I think most lipidic agents are a bit overrated when it comes to fat burning. Like if you were to equate the, you know, the metabolic shift you get from clenbuterol and the increase in, you know, norepinephrine and, and st stimulation you get, it's probably only, you know, one, two, three hundred calories at best. And really eating less food is is, is going to be better. But let's let's bring it back this in terms of drugs. I would say fat burning drug. I would probably say no compared to thyroid hormones because if you are if you are literally having down regulation of your, your, your thyroid uh, when you are dieting, uh, clenbuterol is not going to save you and it's not going to give you any additional apolysis. So I personally would put you know thyroid hormones over clenbuterol. But in terms of like simplicity, something you can just use, which is not going to have like a negative feedback loop or anything, I would say clenbuterol is fantastic. Uh, you would probably just have to care, pay attention to resting heart rate and how high you know you're going to run it. The benefit for females or what benefit in general is I'm gonna say maybe anecdotally, because most of this stuff is, you know, in rodent studies where they basically looked at Clean Brutal's ability to retain muscle tissue in the deficit. But I would say somewhat anecdotally or somewhat vaguely, you know, evidence based or scientifically, we have some evidence that you know Clean Brutal can have uh, a bit of a muscle sparing effect. So for females it can be quite useful in a deficit phase. So I'd say Clenbutrol is great. And then do you want me to talk about your hymn line? Or you, sure. You to? Yeah, might as well. Okay. Um, so, you, so your hymn line, as we know, well, is an alpha-2 adrenic uh, receptor inhibitor, I believe, where basically inhibits those alpha-2 receptors and basically allows for liberation of additional fatty acids, which when you're in deficit phase can be quite benef beneficial to, you know, basically get those quote-unquote stubborn areas of fat when you're deep into an off-season. In addition to that increases there was a norepinephrine you're basically going to get more energy when you're doing cardio so it can be a, you know dish a good tool too but like similar to can be to like you know if you're not and if you're not paying attention to diet if you're not doing cardio just take some bit clean neutral your mind's probably going to do jack shit or you're probably not going to notice it it's basically utilized like one to pretty well into a deficit phase or if you're a female and you want to have a bit of a you know a muscle retention effect can be neutral can be used that's basically yeah <laughs> how quick and dirty are those two yeah, no, I think I, I would honestly rate clenbuterol pretty highly as far like I can just kind of sell those top five. Yeah, I think clenbuterol yeah. is one of the most powerful compounds a female can use in the context of a prep or even in an off season at a microdose. I think thyroid is specifically tailored towards fat loss, except I wouldn't. The problem with that we run into with thyroid hormones is it's they're 
they're untargeted. So you can lose more than just fat mass. You can lose muscle mass and we don't necessarily, and in bone mineral density, which we definitely don't want to do. So the reason that clenbuterol is favorable in most contexts is because it has an ability to preserve muscle tissue as well as allowing more fat loss or an increase in metabolic rate. But correctly, as Adam said, the metabolic rate increase really isn't that much. And people kind of actually overestimate how much it's going to do for you. Now, in terms of like being in a heavy deficit, doing lots of cardio, being near the end of like a fat loss phase, sometimes there's not many levers to pull outside of adding something like clenbuterol. You're already doing an hour and a half of cardio. You're already eating 1200 or less calories. Then in that case, that's why clenbuterol can be increased because the small margin of calories that it will uh, upregulate thermogenesis with is is potent enough to stimulate a, a significant degree of fat loss at that um, degree of caloric intake. So if you consider like what is 50 calories, like how much of a percentage is 50 calories out of a thousand compared to 2000, you know, it's much more significant. So when you really get to the fine details that are granular like that at the end of a prep, that's where it can really make a big impact. But I that's kind of my, yeah. Um, but really good question. I think it's awesome. I would use the shit out of it for most people. <laughs> um, not really, just kidding. Okay, JR Steel asks on Instagram, what are the benefits of supplementing with micronized progesterone for women? What are, do you have any personal anecdotes there? Uh, not really, because to be honest, when it comes to progesterone, at least from my understanding, it's usually when there's deficiency is only when I would probably uh, you look at utilizing it or like even in a contest prep scenario sometimes when, you know, sex hormones are kind of out of whack. But usually uh, I'll be, with most of the females I've at least been coaching, it hasn't been needed as yet, but there are specific use cases for it, I do believe. Yeah, and I, I would agree. There's specific, it's very conditional in how you'd use it. Um, a lot of the times it's going to be for like sex drive related things. So improving sexual function in females. Um, and this is kind of like, again, more of a, we're going to get granular here, but it's more of like a feminine topic as opposed to a masculine one. We don't really discuss these things with males, but like females have a lot of other considerations to sex drive other than just like desiring sex. Like it's also lubrication. It's also dilation. It's also like a lot of different things. And so progesterone can mediate a lot of those features which is important for some females, especially when they are using large degrees of performance enhancing drugs and modulating, you know, endogenous hormone systems quite heavily. And then the other thing that it's used for is stimulating menstrual cycles if they have been absent for a long time, just because progesterone is the main mediator to the buildup of tissue. And then the absence of it is sort of like the release of tissue or what would be menstruation. So it can be used in those contexts. I think more than anything in premenopausal women uh, who have not experienced the symptoms of menopause yet, I think it's useful for upregulating sex drive and it can significantly upregulate thermogenesis, but as a, as almost a counterintuitive point as well, it decreases glucose metabolism. So you kind of, you know, which is the lesser evil, I guess, but it does have a place. And in males, it can specifically increase sexual function as well. Um, it's not very clear as to why it's more thought of like as a neural steroid thing, but it can be effective in, in men just as it is in women. Um, <clears throat> okay. So we got a question from Danny Locanastra. Oh, we got that right. Test shots lumping when I eat like crap. What's the possible cause? Test shots lumping up. Right. like crap okay well i think those are two separate <laughs> issues there um where yeah. i don't know if they necessarily directly correlated but if your testosterone is lumping up it's either the compound itself potentially being contaminated or it's your ejection practices like i know a lot of individuals sort of you know they get confused between intramuscular and subcutaneous injection and what they end up doing uh is actually injected directly into the fat tissue and in many individuals, myself included, that can actually cause lumps or like the skin or the fat tissue to get quite hard. I think uh, Dr. Todd Lee breaks it down on his channel, but basically that can be occurring. So to answer your question, it's hard for us to say, but I would definitely say review your injection protocol. Make sure you're doing a subcutaneous or intramuscular injection correctly. 
then if that is still causing an issue, I would first get some blood work, check your C-reactive protein, see if things out of whack, because more than likely, if you have bunk or contaminated gear, you will have high levels of inflammation, and your C-reactive, you know, high sensitivity uh, C-reactive protein will be elevated. That's the easy way to tell. Or just, just fucking look at the vial, and if there's like a floater or something in there, I mean, as silly as that, that could be it. Uh, eating like crap, or do you should be on testosterone or using PDs if you're eating like shit, because we all know that your health markers are going to get worse, you know, unless you're on legitimate TRT, in which case they can still get worse, but at a much lower rate. Uh, and really, you should be prioritizing your diet. So, I mean, you should know this, my man. Uh, look at all our content. Look at all Colton's content. You know, all the stuff we do at Blood Bolt. Um, you know, your diet is, is paramount. So, look at your injection protocol. Fix your diet, dude, and hopefully that should help. Yeah, I think a lot of it might be immune response as well. Like possibly you have gluten intolerances or a variety of different things, honestly, leaky gut syndrome or anything that would cause upregulation in white blood cells and just an immune response. Um, and then that, that therefore could then cause a slight reaction localized to the injection site. That would be my second best guess. But I think what Adam said is probably true that uh, if you are getting lumps in general, it's more than likely due to the quality of formulation that you're putting into your body, not necessarily the formulation itself. Because if you just took an ampule of bare testovirin, injected it, there should be no reason to have an immune response localized in that injection area outside of the needle going in and out of your body for a few seconds. Um, mm -hmm. So if that is happening, yeah, there could be a correlation to food you're eating, but it could also just be that the gear is not so high quality. Uh, yes. <laughs> oh man, I got lots of questions today. Um, I think this one is a four in one, so I'm going to try to translate as best as I can. NL Techno <laughs> asks, Sir, Pharma Grade versus UGL, which is the best brands? Um, I don't know if he's asking, it's kind of hard to understand here. Maybe he's asking if Pharma is better than UGL or if just what brands we would prefer in both categories. And well, I'll, yeah, make, it, I yeah, I'll make it super easy. Is Pharma better than UGL? Yes. Yes. What brand is it on the stock exchange? Yeah, is it on the stock yeah. exchange? Like, yeah, legit. If, if it's on this, okay, like, yes, it's not a hard and fast rule, but if you're looking at a pharmaceutical company and you Google their name, you don't know who the fuck this pharmacy is. You don't know if this is actually pharmaceutical, it's from like who you knows, Uzbekistan or some shit. Don't worry, I'm sure this could be in Uzbekistan, but it's some fucking random pharmacy, uh, where you have no idea who the fuck they are and that the companies are listed. Probably going to be a low grade pharmaceutical. I'm not saying it's necessarily going to be bad. But that's just a really easy way of looking looking at it. Uh, yes, do some pharmacies, you know, who are listed do shitty things with drugs? Yes, but usually it also means that they have higher, you know, practices and higher quality control levels of scrutiny that they need to adhere to. Uh, so, yeah, that's the easiest. It's impossible for me to go down the list of every pharmacy, but that's probably the biggest yeah. cover. -all. Just look it up. Is it on the is it listed on one of yeah. the stock exchanges globally? Exactly. Yeah, it's, I mean, always, if you can afford it and you can source it, which if you're from any Middle Eastern country, Indonesian country, even some European countries, you should just be able to walk to your local pharmacy and buy a pharmaceutical variant of testosterone, yes. primavolin, or something. Um, I do think pharmaceutical grade is definitely elite. As far as UGL brands go, um, we have a plug. <laughs> that I can make now. Uh, on my website, I have a list of sources that we have certified ourselves through clients and getting their lab works um, that I do for put for sale. So you can get that if you want it. But again, that's only domestic to the US. So I can't say for sure if it's applying to wherever you are from, my man. But thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Um, Victor Ansel asks, and this is so funny because I actually just talked about DHB with Kurt on his podcast, um, but thoughts on DHB? Look, I'm going to say, I think a little bit overrated, we just from the, you know, anecdotally a bit of the post injection pain, as silly as that, that I was getting was like, for whatever reason, maybe it was the quality of DHB I was getting was, you know, intolerable. But also find that, you know, since it basically converts into almost the same compound as bold known, is my understanding, um, mm -hmm. equipoise, that personally I'd rather just use equipoise. Uh, yeah. But it, it's one of those things where it's it's very hard 
to rank anabolics because I feel like opinions on anabolics are personal opinions because as we, I think we just released a video on this or a short little reel on social media where it's like, okay, mo most people are going to react well to testosterone. There's people like me who aerobatize very heavily from it. And whilst I still think it's a good compound, there's a huge degree of personal variability. I mean, Paul talks about how he gets anxiety from nandrolone. You know, mm -hmm. nandrolone may not be the best compound for him where, you know, friend, other coaches like my friend Chris uh, in Bangkok, you know, really thrive well off of, of a high nandrolone or nandrolone only cycles and grew very, very well from it, didn't experience any anxiety and for the most part felt great. Um, so when it comes to DHB specifically, can it be a useful combo? Yes. I don't think it's like this God compound, which well, I don't think many people went there. I have seen people because it's like unique or a bit of an outlier. People go, oh, DHB, it's so strong, it's amazing. I'm like, anecdotally, you know, I just got a shitload of post-injection pain from it. Um, but really, it's it's again, it's going to be what works for you. So not much opinion here, just that I got a lot of post-injection pain from it. I didn't think it was that amazing. I'd rather use EQ. Yeah, um, I heard a lot when myself and Kurt were talking offline. He was discussing like how it's generated in the lab. And if it's put into any sort of, if it's created, it usually turns into like a gelatinous mold almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And you have to dilute it so much for it to even turn into a, a like a workable fluid that it's ridiculous like it just doesn't even make sense and if it's anything above 50 milligrams per milliliter it literally will not hold in in, in concentration so or, or yeah, else it just put into this gelatin and and so you see these brands coming out with like dhp at 100 milligrams per milliliters like that's literally impossible unless they're putting a copious amount of uh, alcohols in there to make sure it's staying mitigated, right? And I don't think it's, there's a definite reason that it causes post-injection pain. And for the amount of post-injection pain and the, the cost of it, you literally should just take Primavolin. <laughs> like just take Primavolin because it's, you're going to get more of an effect and it's more of a certainty. Uh, testo, it's testosterone one is like what is technically called, or one testosterone really, but it's so, it, there's no research like it's not a, a research compound it's just something that someone took in the series of different molecular pathways as a 5-all produced variant of equipoise and thought what happens if we try this as an anabolic hormone found out it didn't work very well uh in context in, in animal studies and there we have it so it was um illegally sold since then period you know it's just not a, a useful compound in, in most people's books um, you don't see pros taking it, and that's for a reason. Um, why is growing calves so hard? That's our, our next question. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> I will say I just feel like they're a st stubborn body part to grow. I think there is a bit of a genetic component there. I also think there's a lot of factors there. Like this, this is this one actually might be a bit interesting to people. I think the way you walk and the way you distribute your weight has a huge effect. On your calves now hear me out with this fucking meathead theory but uh growing up in, a, in, a, in south africa with an all boys sporting school uh, you know we had a lot of lot of sportsmen and i sort of noticed that a lot of the guys similar to myself who were like really flat footed who would work, walk basically on like their non-existent arches usually had quite developed quads or and, and lackluster calves and i would find that when i went uh to uh forget the name of the doctor who specializes in uh walking and feet i forget the name of the diatrist i want to say no is that correct um uh, diatrist, I, pediatrist. I think once no once for a child doctor pediatrist and one's uh looking after feet apologies but you get the idea but basically a foot specialist and yeah. we found that basically me myself having a flat of foot meant i put a lot more uh, tension through my vmo and my quad as well as my knees with very little tension going through my quads i'm sorry my calves Whereas I had individuals with like, you know, normal, you know, didn't need inner soles, anything like that, proper arches in their feet, who sort of walked on their tippy toes, coincidentally had fucking huge calves. Um, leading back to my original point, things as literally like how you walk, your genetic components, how active you are, all can affect calf growth. And I feel like they're very stubborn body parts. So for myself, who has flat feet, who doesn't walk, you know, doesn't activate his calves much when walking, I need to train them along the gym. So then to answer your question, I'll give you, a, or rather give you some advice, a very 
way which I've been using to grow my calves was actually some mild success. I think I even have some before and after photos on my uh, Instagram. But literally, train them as frequently as you can, as intensely as you can, intensely as you can, until you get to the point where they are under recovering. You literally cannot match your performance in the session. Take a day off and repeat. So I train my calves literally every fucking training session, so like six times a week, and I'll just train them literally into the ground. Until I, I get into a session where I'm like, holy fuck, I can't even do carb raises. Uh, I can't, you know, match, even remotely match the performance I did. In which case, I'll take a day off, like rest day from carbs and repeat. Because in my personal experience, there's such a stubborn body part to grow. I don't even bother with being like, okay, my ma- maximum recovery volume is this. You know, I'm going to, I just literally try to train it to the edge, so to speak, and then take a step back. And I use intensity modifiers like my reps, like drop set, like supersets giant sets uh because i find straight sets are not going to cover it and you don't want to be training cars for like an hour so i get in there get it for hit it first in the gym first thing of the workout use an intensity modifier and do it every fucking time do that for a year plus in a caloric surplus and even if you got stick shit carbs like me they will grow they will grow yeah i think it's just a matter of if you have the desire to put in that much work they will yes. grow they're just like yes Volume, it, this is kind of one of the funny things when people talk about volume not being the main mediation to hypertrophy, which I, it's obviously not, but there's multiple, but it is one of the main mediators to hypertrophy. Right. And a lot of people will disregard that. But when you look at calves, people walk on them every single day and you'll find that the more heavier a person is and the more they tend to lean forward as they walk, the more large calves they have. And it kind of proves the whole debate of is volume really a necessity um kind of right it is a necessity because those dudes have the biggest calves or those females have the biggest calves and i don't know about you but some of the the thai people i see here who do a lot of soccer it's another big sport out here they have huge calves but they're not training their calves like they don't even go to the fucking gym they're just using them in sport a lot and it's like the more you use them the more they grow and i think if you can train them intensely at a very high volume without getting bored and wanting to shoot yourself, they'll grow, <laughs> you know, yeah. for sure. Um, Seth Cardos asked this question, and it is, is there any benefit to taking GH secretagogues like HGH, Frag, Tessa, Tessa um, if you're already taking growth hormone? And I think, or maybe just by chance, we had a very similar question in my Instagram DMs. This might be the same guy, I'm unsure. But then the guy in my DMs had asked HGH versus secretagogues like Um, which is better. So kind of a similar stream of question. Is there any benefit to taking HGH secretagogues, which HGH frag is not a secretagogue, just want to clarify that, um, or testimorelin compared to GH, or which is better, GH or the secretagogues? Yeah. Well, long story short, I think GH is better. It's like sort of uh, exogenous GH is better. It's like Comparing enoclomiphene to testosterone, although I would say in this case, GH secretagogues, I think, are a little bit more potent than enoclomiphene. Uh, but yeah, I personally don't see the point if you're running exogenous growth hormone. The only use cases I would see for it is like if you really can't afford much growth hormone and maybe you're running like one IU or something like that. Uh, but then I would say to question, isn't the price of the GH secretagog like fucking pretty similar to the growth hormone? Just put it into more growth hormone. But let's say you're in this weird position where you can only like run one IU of growth hormone per day. Yeah, sure, running a secretagog may be worthwhile. In another use case where it may be beneficial is you want the, the off-label effects from it. So take MK677. Let's say you want the hunger stimulation from it, okay? Uh, because it's, you know, st- stimulating ghrelin levels, uh, which can obviously stimulate hunger as well. Yeah, it might be beneficial, but then obviously you have to look at the other side effects, like, you know, your fasting glucose and things like that. So those are the use cases for it. But in my opinion, if you have the access and funds to exogenous growth hormone, use that. Just fucking use that and you'll get way better results. Yeah, I concur. You're always going to get better results from testosterone uh, compared to like a, it's one of its, like a test booster, right? And it's the same yeah. application here. Secretagogues do have a large impact, I think. MK677 does something like a almost 10x increase to local, uh, in the, sorry, not localized systemic IGF-1 levels, but only for a very momentary period in, in time. 
And it's so uncontrollable in terms of your effect from it and or repeatable effects from it and or off target effects that it's just not necessarily worth it. In my opinion, if I have someone who's completely opposed to growth hormone, we'll do MK677. Um, and I think intermittent use of MK67 is in 677 or another secretagogue is a whole nother question because there's we have five different dimer types in serum that we produce. And when we inject, it's only one, but that's a whole different kind of pharmacokinetic conversation. I think your money's best spent with HGH as opposed to taking secretagogues. And things like, just to clarify, Seth, HGH frag is just a fragmented amino acid series from the full series of HGH, the peptide series that creates HGH. Um, and yeah. the theory is HGH frag is the lipolytic um, series of, I mean, this is obviously not correct. I'm just putting it in like simple terms. Uh, the, 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 the part of HGH that will cause lipolysis or fat loss. Um, so it's not actually increasing in production of growth hormone like a secretagogue would. I hope that's uh, answering the question. Yeah. So, um, and then we have one from CV. Resting heart rate is one of, uh, sorry, it's one of the given pieces of information when you take blood pressure, but rarely discussed further. I feel like we talk about resting heart rate all the time. Man. But <laughs> not other factors such as T3 slash clenbuterol. At what point is it too high? Um, you want to shoot, then I'll shoot. Hmm. Uh, this is a tough one because I know theoretically what is too high. Often in application, we kind of just accept anyway. I would, as you said, is it? I think any you know five beats uh, per minute above sixty increases your rates of what all cause mortality. Do. I think what you said ten percent, but basically five beats per minute above sixty, or every you know five beats or amount above sixty, would be considered somewhat deleterious. So. Too high, it depends what, what perspective you're looking from. From a completely optimal perspective, if you can keep it around 60, that'd be fantastic. So 70 could be too high. 80, 75 could be too high. 80 would be too high. I would say for an enhanced bodybuilder who's quite heavy, ideally 70 and under, I would say. If I would if I have a client, depending what phase they're in, right? If they're like two weeks out from a show and we're running a fair bit of lipolytic agents. T3 clean, so on and so forth, and it like creeps up a little bit in the 70s. That's an unfortunate trade off, which we'll probably have to make at that point. It's not ideal, but let's say they're like in the off season uh, and you just see their resting heart rate climbing. That's the point where we have to assess do we have to pull back? Do we have to run like, you know, a deficit phase? Do you have to change, you know, the drug protocol? What is going on there? Uh, in that case, it's something I wouldn't want to accept. So it really depends what phase you're in and your circumstance, but I would try to say, 70 or under ideally yeah i think it's it's definitely contextual um to the person because you'll have guys who are like 370 pounds or 300 or not 300 270 pounds <laughs> um upwards of that even and yeah like your heart's gonna be fucking struggling at that weight it is not normal it is unhealthy to be that weight um for any extended period of time but that being said um i think most people should be under 70 beats per minute at or even below 60 beats per minute is where I would like to see most people. I'm pretty aggressive with that and will use like pharmacological therapies to influence that if needed. Um, but it's something that for me at least I think is a huge factor in the risk of cardiovascular disease for bodybuilders because we used to think a lot of not like we scare literally about nothing, right? Heart rate or blood pressure. Then we started to focus a lot more on blood pressure. Now I think the focus needs to be put on as well heart rates because that is a, a really big mediator in, in heart morphology, how your heart changes, uh, as well as endothelial function in general. And if you guys remember, um, rest in peace, Boston Lloyd, uh, he had basically his aortic valve explode. And that was from his, yes, high blood pressure, but his resting heart rate, he said many times, was like he would wake up with like 90 to 100 beats per minute. And like that kind of shit will absolutely kill you with long enough time under that dur duress. Um, so when I have clients coming and they're like 80 beats per minute, 85 beats per minute, and that's like their waking resting heart rate, there's definitely, definitely some work that needs to be done to modulate that into an appropriate range so that we're not experiencing any sort of um, issues for sure. Whenever, 
<laughs> um, yeah. Harem, maybe. <laughs> well, he's local in here in, in uh, Pattaya. And uh, there's a lot of funny opinions about him. So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. We've, we've saved the lady boys for him. We're not too sure, guys. I yeah. feel like I'd have to walk him over the chastity belt. Yeah. Yeah. He's an interesting fella. Um, I don't know. Adam's met him a few times at the gym. I've yet to see his face, but I don't really need to, to be honest. Love the guy, but yeah. thought we could talk in code. For CV, yeah, we're here for you, man. It's definitely something that's worth getting down. Um, I would look at, obviously, in term, it, one thing that n almost all bodybuilders are hesitant against is doing cardio for some reason. It's something I do every single day. Um, I texted Adam, like I have like this accountability text to text him. One of those things is getting like 3,000 steps a day. And I do that on like a treadmill at a really high incline at a fast speed. So I'm getting my heart rate up, sweating. Mm -hmm. Um, and making an effort there. And I think it's something that everyone needs to get used to doing hit cardio, doing low intensity, steady state cardio, getting your steps in. That's like the best way to get it down. Honestly. Mm -hmm. Um, I think obviously that's considering the fact that you're hydrated. I think hydrated being hydrated is probably the first thing. And then doing cardio is the second thing. And then on top of that, then it's just trying to modulate your stimulant intake. And then still, if you're experiencing a high heart rate, using pharmacology, like an in, in ACE inhibitor, um, like Nabivalol, in, in Papanolol, one of those guys to get your heart rate down is gonna be the best, the best move out of them all, so. Yeah, and also just dropping body fat too, because you think about it as well. The heavier you, if you, you know, the heavier you are, the more strain you just basically put on your whole system excluding including your organs especially the heart muscle and you know as a bodybuilder or just someone who wants to be fit in general if you're holding excess weight ideally you want it muscle mass which is why even as a bodybuilder even if you're you know shredded but you're like 280 pounds or 300 pounds it will be hard to control your resting heart rate so if you are a heavy individual i would say try make most of that muscle mass don't basically carrying excess body fat for a number of reasons including resting heart rate is never a good thing so if you if you think you can be a leaner that's also a good method to try. Just reduce it from that. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Um, okay, so I have one more Instagram question that we have yet to answer, um, which is, fuck, Mary kill, stair climber, incline walk, or recumbent bike? That's a tough one. Um, depends, depends if you're looking at personal preference and, or you're looking at like what you think is best. Personally, I think incline uh treadmill is probably going to be the best overall simply because it's going to be probably the least systemically fatiguing but still give you good yeah. output enough to increase your resting heart rate uh or just your heart rate in general whereas the stair climber i think is probably best on stimulus best on increasing your heart rate best on time efficiency but it's also the most systemically fatiguing then personally i think recumbent bike is like super low levels fatigue but i struggle to get like high heart rate on recumbent bike i just i don't know i just personally don't fucking enjoy it i know a lot of people do but i feel like i have to do double the amount of cardio on a recumbent yep. bike as opposed to incline uh treadmill or a stairmaster so treadmill one for me two would be uh stairmaster last would be so kill would be recumbent bike uh fuck would be stairmaster mac would be yes. incline treadmill that's that's exactly what I was gonna say. I love the stairmaster because it's hard. Not everyone does it, and it's like brutalizing, but it's almost yeah. like a, a a nice brutalizing where you have like this really awkward relationship with it, where you kind of look forward to it, but you start doing it, and you hate yourself, and then afterwards you kind of love it. And then the treadmill is just like, all right, I can roll out of bed and get on that thing. There's not really much thought that goes into it, and it gets you a nice mm -hmm. stimulus without any kind of impact or fatigue development. Um, and I can do it forever, literally. So it's yeah. that's definitely the one I'd marry. And then the recumbent bike is exactly the same. Like, if anything, I hurt my taint more on a recumbent bike after using it for like 30 minutes than yeah. actually getting cardio in. So mm -hmm. I usually try to just like not use the recumbent bike very religiously. Mm -hmm. Um, Yan Torta, Tort, Tortilis, Tort, Yan Tortilis, we'll go with that. How can I enhance my recovery process from a minor injury I had? I need a small wound to close, and the sooner the better. I already, I'm already on three IU's of GH per day. 
is there anything else I can add? Absolutely. There's a ton. Yes. Um, um, and well, I'll buy. Yeah, I'll yeah. buy all the usual stuff. Uh, as yeah. Colton just mentioned, Anavar, okay, we know it's been used in burn victims to upregulate collagen synthesis. So, I mean, you said minor surgery, uh, a small wound. I'm guessing maybe that's an incision where they did the surgical procedure. So, Anavar to upregulate collagen synthesis. I believe primobolin has a similar effect. What you can also look at doing, which we always mentioned, is it's going to be a bit painful, but injecting locally around the site. Uh, peptides like DPC-157 body protective compound 157 or TB-500, okay? They work through uh, what's it, angiogenesis, basically formation of capillaries, small or blood vessels at that site, which is going to transport additional oxygen and nutrients will help the wound heal and close. So I would say the collagen synthesis, uh, anabolics like the animal, uh, things like the peptides, and then your growth hormone. And then other than that, just keep it clean and <laughs> don't do anything silly. Uh, a cold, I'm sure any other compounds I'm missing. Um, the only other one that I'd add in this context when it's related to like a, a skin issue would be there's two, and these are a bit of strange, but I bet you could probably get enough recovery from TB500 and BPC157. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of them is um, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm spacing, it's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, it's the hormone that you release after coming. Not sure about the love hormone. No, uh, the love uh, hormone. Oxytocin. Okay. Holy shit. I don't know why that took so long to think of. Yeah. Oxytocin. They make like little sachets. You can get them from Rise HRT if you want. So go ahead and reach out to Rise HRT. Um, good call, CV, but it's oxytocin. Uh, you guys are right. Prolactin does come out in post sexual uh, interaction, but. Oxytocin can increase collagen synthesis tremendously, almost more than anything that we use. It's just the problem is finding it, administering it religiously, um, and also dealing with, I mean, it's not really dealing with the cognitive benefits because it's kind of fun to take, you get a little euphoric, but um, it's more so just like understanding that you're gonna feel a little wonky after taking it. Good to have before sex too. So if you really wanna up your game, you have a small injury, you have a girl, take the, uh, the, uh, the, the sachet, Put it under your tongue, let it dissolve, and then go bang and then heal. Um, and then the al alternative to that is GHK copper locally injected as well. What you can do is like a protocol is locally inject um, TB500 orally administer BPC157. Locally inject the other day, so every other day do TB500, and then every other day intermittently between those days locally inject G uh, GHK copper. And then I would do like every other day an administration orally of um, the, uh, I'm already forgetting it again. It's like such an unspoken hormone. hormone. No, no, the, the love hormone. <laughs> I'm Oxy forgetting uh, it. Oxytocin? No, yes, oxytocin. I, I keep saying, I keep thinking of <laughs> uh, oxymethylone for some reason. Like that's not, that's thinking not what I'm thinking about. Yeah, like oxytocin. Oxy <laughs> <laughs> no, oxytocin. Um, you can get it from Rise HRT. They have little uh, sachets, and like sachets are little gel packs. You just put them on your tongue, and they dissolve rapidly, and they go into the uh, the capillaries underneath your tongue, those blue veins. So um, that works pretty good too. That's what I've noticed. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a pretty conclusive question. If you yeah, do those we, things, you'll be critical. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's like the best wound here in healing, healing protocol you could do. Um, all right. Well, Adam, it looks like we're out of questions. You got anything else for us today? I think that pretty much covers most things. I think, like I said, most of the stuff we covered on IGF-1 is what I spoke on being. We get a lot of growth hormone questions, but yeah, pharmaceutical exogenous is always going to be your best, guys. I feel like we should be putting up a frequently asked questions at this point. It's like, yeah. it's a... An AI bot, like, to into question about growth hormone immediately. <laughs> Pharmaceutical is the best, more is better. Yeah, we have yeah. a chat GPT moderator that like analyzes the comments yeah. and just repeats what he said. We gotta, get, we gotta get that in there. But it's a what guy, we should do. Yeah. What we should do is create an FAQ document, kind of like uh, the infamous TT has that we always refer to. Um, I think that would be a good, good tool. I've been asked for that so many times now. That's why I made the source list. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should make that so we can like link it to the bottom of our videos and just have it downloadable for people. So whenever they 
want yeah. questions answered that we probably have already answered they can do it there instead of hopping here but yeah we should probably start compiling that because yeah it's the same thing too a lot of these questions uh, are quite common that's okay There's nothing wrong with asking a question again but it'd probably be good to have like yeah, a resource to refer yeah. to yeah like an encyclopedia of sorts be useful mm. Mm. all right guys well thank you so much for tuning in it was a little bit later than it's supposed to be and i appreciate that we have hectic schedules um, but we made it work and we will be here next week the same day um i should be by the looks of it going on a podcast with Kurt on Friday again. So we'll be there as well as the Saturday podcast uh, with Paul's team. So there's just hecticness going on all around. But nonetheless, we'll see you guys later. So make sure you stay tuned. And if you have any other further questions, you can always comment them at the bottom of this video. Um, we'll make sure to pick them up on the next video. So deuces, have a beautiful evening for you Americans, and we will catch you all later. Thanks, guys.